Uh, entrepreneurs are a little different. Um, but since 1979, I've created my own job. And um, so you have to keep uh, several irons in the fire. And uh, this is a new concept that we have been exploring at Ex Exploration Partners. Uh, we've been in business for about four years, uh, mostly in um, shuttle activity. Uh, we're going to talk about a two-cell, higher efficiency, basic concept, which we need to move toward a business uh, as quick as we can. And uh, we're a little bit frustrated by the fact that we've been looking at space solar power for 40 years. And uh, the original Peter Glazer design, uh, I can remember back to the Lincoln conference where uh, we were really excited about uh, space solar power. And I put in a paper and quickly forgot about it. And um, I had a friend of mine call me and say uh, he read it, which doesn't mean much, but other than I'm that old. Um, so we're going to split the. Uh, this one, this. I got it. Um, oh. Okay, let me talk a little about the introduction. Well, maybe not. All right. Uh, <laughs> forget the introduction. Uh, basic concept, we're uh, using two different uh, PV cells. Uh, we're bringing in solar radiation. Uh, we're looking at ground systems uh, initially to uh, create some money. And that we uh, then uh, use a, a hot uh, filter, a hot mirror, and a cold mirror to split that, that light frequency to uh, give the cells down there in blue uh, the kind of frequency that they are most appreciate and can create uh, more than uh, normal um, power from. Um, we also then add massive uh, solar concentration. And uh, it looks something like this with the uh, reflectors uh, visible. And um, so as entrepreneurs, we think about the future market, how we sell this thing in the uh, the real world of uh, roofs uh, in New Mexico, for example, or elsewhere in America. And um, we have to then be lower in cost initially and higher in uh, efficiency than the uh, low cost leader, which appears to be Harbor Freight up here in the, in the top. And uh, they get to about $3 a, a watt. Um, so this would be the beginnings of a, of a concept that we're starting to explore. And uh, I won't speak any more about the roof uh, uh, tops units, but uh, more about the space unit because uh, basically we're at a space conference. Um, so the energy comes in from the side. And uh, uh, heats, uh, it bounces off and heats up this uh, small set of um, uh, PV cells. And um, then it, uh, it generates uh, enough electricity that we have uh, active cooling that, that cools that. And then a large uh, transmitter for uh, transmitting to the ground, to the ground customer. And uh, we have other things that are always inherent on satellites that include uh, propellant tanks and, and all that. Um, we're looking at several designs. This is the same design you've just seen, but in kind of three dimension. And we're looking at um, the possibility of the launch vehicle being part of our radiator system. Because when you get into massive solar concentration like we're, we're envisioning, you end up with a lot of heat. And uh, we need ways of getting rid of that heat. So we're looking uh, to think of a Delta II launch with a um, demonstrator satellite that would um, look something like this. Certainly not a final design, but we do think that the, uh, the radiator tanks uh, idea might, might be of benefit for us. Another uh, four reflector system, which would use um, uh, inflatable reflectors that would focus on a, uh, a red X kind of a, um, a receiving device that looks a, a about like that. 
uh, with solar cells on these uh, surfaces up and down and um, we would still use that uh, splitting of the of the sunlight frequency to uh, to get to a system that is a bit more complicated when you yeah um, so if you'll go down to the lower left uh, your lower left corner there we use a special PV cell uh, right here uh, behind this this mirror and another cell along here and they then um, add the mirrors that were added here uh, and then over on the third corner here we've got the sunlight coming in the the frequency split and so each cell gets the the kind of uh, sunlight that it, it does does best and then uh, as you might imagine, will be limited by active cooling. So we think that the cooling could be as sophisticated as liquid metal, um, but uh, when we're looking at massive solar concentration, um, we would expect to go as high as we can go and still actively cool it. So cooling may be the, the limiting factor for us. Uh, this is a rainbow concept, um, and um, most of you are probably familiar with it. I won't spend a lot of time, but this is a Fresnel lens, sunlight coming in, and there's six solar cells on the side that are, are described here, and they, they get then a, an increase in um, a created or, or uh, the electrical output. So we're always interested in the market and uh, what market might be captured by such a device. Um, and as an entrepreneur, you, you can't pour billions of dollars into something without, without a market that would um, pay back uh, the investors. So we think that the uh, easiest market for us to uh, approach would be the 20 degrees north and south of the equator. And in those regions, we've got uh, underdeveloped countries, mining companies, and other people who basically burn diesel fuel for uh, for power uh, i've lived in some of those areas and uh, they don't have the sophistication of of giant power grids and stuff like we have in a developed country so they're probably um, susceptible to six and eight dollar uh, a gallon diesel and it could be double or triple that in uh, uh, the coming decades um, We also make some other changes so that we can actually get a system in orbit as, as, fairly, as fast as we can. So we're really saying that these, these uh, beginning demo satellite would um, actually be down to just under the Van Allen belt, which is, probably starts about 900 kilometers up. And um, so we would have the ability to, to raise these satellites once they, they, uh, they come down. We also then would be passing over our customer, uh, customer's rectenna, and we hope uh, electronically steering our, our transmitters so that we can feed them power for 5, 10, 15 minutes while we're over them. And we would do that 12 to 15 times a day. So it's a little different than uh, everybody envisions with the, the units that uh, geostationary. We believe in, in order to get us started, we have to attack some of the barriers that we currently see within the, uh, the space solar power arena. Um, we have reduced the number of vehicles it takes to get to uh, the final use location by, by one trip. Uh, going to GEO, of course, is usually thought of as being assembled in, in low Earth orbit and then uh, transmitted uh, or ion propulsed, uh, propelled up to uh, geostationary. So we've eliminated that geostationary trip we also eliminated the ability to spend billions and never get the first kilowatt out uh, until you've actually spent that money and put it in orbit. Um, we think that we can put together a demo that might deliver electricity to uh, equatorial customers uh, on, as a demo and prove out the concept and get us into a financing scenario that quite frankly uses the same financing scenarios and, and mechanisms that are used in the communications industry today. So we're really in the business of leasing satellites, not necessarily producing power. Our
power customer on the ground would be the retail um, electrical seller or that we, that we have in all developed countries. The people that you pay your power bill to would be the guy would be receiving our power. So it's a little bit different than what we normally think of in a developed country. And uh, we expect to make those people uh, wealthy uh, by joining us early on. Uh, everybody believes that we need to raise the solar cell efficiently before we can get into um, big time operations in space solar power. We believe that solar concentration, maybe even massive solar concentration, can uh, take the kind of cells that we can get out of the lab today and uh, with a little bit of innovation make them the, the beginning of, of a different industry. Um, large systems uh, in space solar power also require large rectennas on the ground and fairly large hardware in orbit. We've reduced most of that mass to uh, both on the ground and in, in uh, orbit by changing the method and changing the, the, uh, the way we do things. Um, also, it has an effect on many other things. Um, big rectennas and, and all of the power coming down to one location also requires a power grid. Uh, and um, what we've uh, done here is uh, reduce some of that. Now, about a year and a half ago, we did a study that uh, looked at the manned shuttle arrive vehicle, which of course now is thought to be uh, dead and buried, although uh, there are some indications that's not true. Um, and so we did a little bit of work on what we could do with the space shuttle if we uh, modernized it a bit. We used the old hardware, but used it in a new way. We uh, also have been working with some of the shuttle arrive people and advocates that are are still in the government. And um, we came up with this concept for a uh, larger space solar power unit. And uh, here's the long kind of uh, mechanisms. They're in inflatable, uh, inflatable structures that really put together and come up with something like this. The, uh, the inflatable structure you saw is really this, and this, and this. All the way around, we leave the tank in there because we expect to use that as a radiator. Um, and the uh, vehicle uh, payload came up in this particular vehicle. Uh, if we become sophisticated, we might take the engines back to Earth, but uh, for right now, we don't worry about it. So this is the, uh, the hemisphere, the half a circle here that, that heats up these uh, solar, solar cells. Uh, of course, you need active cooling, but it, this becomes a fairly large uh, facility in orbit. It would, again, be under the Van Allen belt, and because it's so big and bulky, it would probably re-enter without additional uh, re reboost propellant in about 11 years. Um, the external tank unaided has been looked at about going to orbit, and at 300 nautical miles, it will uh, re-enter in about 11 years. So. This is big and bulky, but what happens is that it's uh, got some natural uh, issues as well. Uh, if you've got the sun coming in from the, uh, the right, uh, you've got some of these uh, different areas excited by the, the uh, sunlight. Uh, the earth, of course, here is in the center, but you also have the external tank, which because it has some foam on it, will go to, to bright metal in about a year uh, to 18 months in orbit just by spalling off. So that would become our radiator. There's actually two, two tanks of 19,000 cubic feet here and another 53,000, 54,000 cubic feet of internal volume that we would use. And uh, we've been thinking about what kind of radiator that might, might make for us. Um, but also uh, it's, uh, fair to say that you'd, you'd need to have the, uh, the radiation to the blackness of space. And this whole long body, which is about 200 feet long in orbit, would rotate 360 degrees on every orbit. And it would be going around the Earth about 12 to 15 times a day. So we're still radiating down to 
to uh, willing customers here and here and here and here. And um, we don't have any basic uh, energy storage here, but because we pass over customers so often in the day, we expect their facility on the ground would have uh, new flywheels or whatever it would take for storage of the power. So we've changed the thinking a little and in hopes of uh, getting into a, a business as quick as possible, certainly quicker than 40 years. And so I began to look at uh, what the power system in a developed country looks like. And it's uh, kind of like this with a generating station here, uh, an up, uh, a step up transformer, big transmission line, step down transformer, and, and then a th set of three customers here. So our first customer would be a ground solar, which I haven't said much about, but um, uh, that customer could become a, a, a rooftop kind of customer. And then we ask ourselves, where do we plug into that existing system in a well-developed country without creating a lot of uh, a competition and a lot of people who are angry? Because um, we're really approaching everything from the coal mines to the generating station and the step up and transmission lines step down, we think we could enter here like space solar power people do now and all of that would be used by, by the large uh, geostationary power plants. But we would prefer to enter here and serve these three customers with a smaller rectenna because we're closer to Earth and, it, and we're a new green system and basically the coal mine all the way up to the uh, to the to the transformer in here somewhere uh, are industries that are no longer required for our system so it has some impact economically and that's kind of what we look for as entrepreneurs so the future if we're able to get this kind of innovation into uh, into use in orbit will eventually drive our, our uh, species off the planet into uh, other adventures around the solar system. But we're basically saying go back to the sun uh, and quit using the, the re renewable resources that have been stored on our planet, uh, and which originally came from the sun as well. Um, and then we think America as an innovation leader needs to be that nation that does that, use that innovation to uh, create a new system. And uh, we think that's part of the payback that taxpayers get for supporting the space program for 60 years. So that's it. Thank you.